Hello and welcome. I'm Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History here in Washington, D.C. I'm an honored guest on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people, and it's a true and special and humbling moment for me to be able to moderate this session. This symposia, The Other Slavery, Histories of Indian Bondage from New Spain and Southwestern United States is going to zero in in this session as we explore the painful, complicated, and ongoing intersections of kinship and genocide in California. I'm honored to have four distinguished guests with me uh, today. And as we, um, as we come into this, let's come into it with community, uh, with respect for the multiplicity of stories, multiplicity of perceptions and perspectives. Um, and the ways in which together we are creating a powerful and complicated weave of the past so that we can also together create a more just, compassionate, and informed future. It's a privilege to start the panel uh, with uh, Erica Perez. And Erica comes to us um, right now um, as an associate professor of history at the University of Arizona in Tucson and an affiliate of the Gender and Women's Studies and Latin American Studies program. As a historian, she probes the complicated contours of United States, Mexican Americans, gender, sexuality, and the ongoing colonial and imperial processes. In particular, she, um, like me, is a girl from Southern California, and she became interested in a lifelong passion in US history from her family their understanding of their past and how she continues to explore that. Educated at UC Berkeley, San Francisco State and UCLA, um, Erica's interests in the inter-ethnic encounters of colonizers, colonial rule, acts of community resistance will bring so much to this panel. She continues to also uh, pr produce and publish and teach and give of her time um, and is an award-winning historian, uh, as well as uh, a very active uh, and um, incredible voice as we understand, especially the impact of the past and present on children, um, delving into women as community builders and understanding the complications of sexuality. Um, at University of Arizona, Erica teaches a great array of history classes, uh, women on the US, Mexican Americans, comparative history of witchcraft panics. Um, if you have a full range of, of interests, uh, as well as where she, I think, is so, um, has taught us so much about comparative borderlands um, as well. So it's, without further ado, uh, it's a pleasure to bring Erica to the Zoom screen. So my thanks uh, to the Smithsonian Institute, to Althea, um, to everyone, my fellow panelists. Uh, I come uh, from Arizona, which is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, specifically Tucson, Arizona, which is the homelands uh, where the Tohono O'odham and Yaqui peoples reside and, and live. So I am a guest of those peoples. Um, so my interest in compadrasco, uh, Catholic godparentage, uh, stems way back to having grown up in California surrounded by mission architecture, this kind of Spanish fantasy heritage that surrounded me, uh, as well as being a fourth grader in California who was required to undergo um, a history of the missions as part of the curriculum for public schools. And that is something that always stood with me because I realized from an early age that much of the emphasis was on architecture, on the missionaries themselves, but very little was said about indigenous people's experiences. Um, instead, the image was one of benevolence, um, of this colonizing influence. Um, and I, as someone who was raised Catholic, I also am someone who experienced um, multiple sets of godparents and became a godparent myself to two children who were bicultural, bi-ethnic. And as someone who was going through graduate school and exposed to wonderful scholars of colonial history, it got me thinking about the emphasis, a heavy, heavy emphasis 
on English America and colonialism and the relatively little attention paid to those areas that were claimed by Spanish colonizers or even French colonizers. And so I thought I would meld some of my interests and personal experiences with some of my research um, areas and that led me to looking at Compadrasco. Now in the Iberian context, Compadrasco typically occurred among groups of people who were already familiar with one another, usually family members, but sometimes people within the same community who had prior knowledge and experiences with each other. But when we're talking about the introduction of Compadrasco in parts of the Americas where Spanish colonizers are entering a region, and they are imposing military rule along with an uh, effort to engage in spiritual conquest. You don't have that previous experience with each other. And so I was interested in these inter-ethnic encounters. And in those early phases, what we see is very often missionaries imposing godparent assignments on Native peoples in those very early years uh, until a Catholic community had evolved among Native peoples themselves by which they could start to um, engage in their own selection process for godparenting. Uh, but those early stages reflect a social barometer of early Alta California power dynamics and efforts to rule. For example, you would have Spanish, Mexican soldiers, settlers, workers who would come into the region who were often positioned as the role of godparent and native peoples were positioned as you know, the role of the baptizee, the person being sponsored. And with godparenting, there are bonds of reciprocity and obligation that that entails. And so there might be some material benefits that could flow from godfathers, for example, to their godchildren through, say, cloth, through extra food, perhaps perhaps protection from certain forms of violence. Um, and this is a tool to try to further colonial rule in Alta California, to get native peoples enmeshed in these systems of reciprocity and obligation. But they were not the ones who were sponsoring Spanish, Mexican settlers, soldiers, their children. So this reflects that asymmetry of power in these early colonial periods, in these early interethnic encounters. We also see godparenting offers women certain outlets and roles for authority. And again, I think this is an overlooked period of many colonial histories as the role of women as community builders and sustainers. And so, for example, we have Spanish Mexican colonial women like Felipa Osuna of San Diego, who as an unmarried woman sponsored uh, two older indigenous women, one 75 years old and one in her 50s respectively. And this to me is a really good example of this kind of social barometer that we see through Compadrasco, uh, because here you have an unmarried woman who is going to be as godmother, she's going to demand respect and deference from her godchildren, in this instance, mature older women. And this in itself is a really good way of seeing how Spanish Mexican women themselves are participating in these colonial projects, are participating in the shaping of these new settle, settler colonial societies in the Americas. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we also see that if you are the indigenous women from this standpoint, you know, you are on the lower end of that social hierarchy and that type of dynamic and relationship. Because as a godchild, you're supposed to pay deference and respect to your godparent. Um, and so I think by looking at these sacramental records that um, are otherwise very dry to look at, uh, we could really tease out everyday encounters, these kinds of social dynamics and pressures uh, it, within Alta California. Now that's not to say that native peoples themselves did not assert their own agency and will when it came to uh, family dynamics, trying to assert kinship in their own right. We know, for example, that we have certain women throughout several of the missions in Southern California who were repeat sponsors of various members of their communities. Uh, they were trusted as, as members of the mission community and they are um, not necessarily going to be able to bestow material wealth or, or um, resources to their godchildren. So that dynamic really conveys more emphasis on the spiritual, on the kinship dynamic, and 
and, and, and cultural value rather than on any kind of material benefit, as you might see, say, perhaps from a Spanish Mexican godparent to an indigenous godchild. And so what I think is important to remember is that although you do have this Catholic godparenting ritual being introduced and imposed on Native peoples, they did have their own practices of sponsorship through puberty rituals and other kinds of life stage rituals and ceremonies where sponsorship was very important. And so just because they are performing these Spanish Catholic rituals does not mean that they are wholly, you know, embracing in, in its entirety uh, Catholic orthodoxy. Uh, I think it's important to note that they already had their own existing kinship practices, systems of, of knowledge and transmission of knowledge. Um, among groups of women, groups of men. And so they're using Catholic God parentage to their own ends. Um, and the last thing I would say uh, as part of my comments for this initial presentation is the naming practices. We see, unfortunately, the erasure of indigenous names through Spanish Catholic God parenting rituals. What often happens are, is that godchildren will be given an honorific name, usually after their godparent. Um, and that leads to the erasure very often, especially in the sacramental records of many indigenous lineages, ancestry, uh, their own names and, and traditions. And this has become problematic for some of today's living, breathing indigenous peoples who need to use those records to seek federal recognition, to prove that their longevity in the region. And so I think it's important that we see that God parenting reveals um, both areas and avenues for authority, you know, cultural continuity, a resistance, but also there are darker elements to it as well when we're talking about colonial encounters. Thank you so much, Erica. And also thank you too for your outstanding book that, that um, I think so much of, of uh, your, your sharing with us stems from, uh, Colonial Intimacies, Interethnic Kinship, Sexuality and Marriage in Southern California from 1769 to 1885, and congratulations for winning the Coalition of Western Women uh, Historians um, Armitage Jameson Book Prize uh, a couple of years ago for that outstanding book um, given to um, the leading monograph in Western women's gender um, history, uh, gender of history, women's history, and sexuality history. So congratulations on that, and thank you so much. It's, uh, it's an honor as well uh, to introduce our next panelist uh, to your audiences. Uh, Benjamin Madley is an associate professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Shorthanded, of course, is UCLA. He there is an historian of Native America, the United States, the history of colonialism, especially how colonialism uh, has manifested itself across time in world history. He too is a Southern California baby born in, actually a Northern California baby born in Redding. Um, and he spent much of his childhood up in Karuk country near the Oregon border. And that I think has shaped uh, his perspective as historians, much like Erica's uh, and mine um, have been shaped by that. Ben was educated at Yale and Oxford. Um, and he ex has that expansive worldview as he probes colonialism in Africa, Australia, Europe, as well as here in the United States, and more focusedly and particularly for today in California. His first book, American Genocide, the United States in the California Indian Catastrophe from 1846 to 1873, receiving the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for History and, any, and a number of awards. Um, congratulations, Ben. Uh, including the Heyday Book Award, um, uh, was also named to the New York Times Book Review's Editor's Choice. Um, and his unveiling of the power um, for us to understand, especially the legacies of genocide um, in the American period in California, I think has helped reshape, along with Erica's work, uh, the historiography of, of that time period of the 19th century and its legacies. Um, according to uh, former governor of California, Jerry Brown, madly corrects the record with his, with his gripping story of what really happened. 
the actual genocide of a vibrant civilization, thousands of years in the making, end quote. So it is an honor to welcome Benjamin to the panel, and thanks again. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. I very much appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here today, and for all the many people who are working to make this panel possible. I'd also like to acknowledge the Tonga Gabrielino people on whose land I have the privilege uh, to work and to come to you from today. And I'd like to let everyone know that the material we're gonna be covering in my brief presentation is pretty rough stuff. So uh, just be forewarned. So between 1846 and 1873, California's indigenous population plummeted from perhaps 150,000 people to just 30,000 survivors. Diseases, dislocation, starvation, these were causes of many of the deaths, but there was also something else going on in this catastrophe, and that something else was genocide. California's first legislature convened in 1850, and one of their very first acts was to ban all Indian people from voting, to bar most Indians from giving testimony for or against whites in criminal cases, and denying Indians the right to serve as witnesses or jurors. State legislators later banned California Indian people from serving as attorneys. So when you think about what all of this means in combination, it barred Indian people from participation in or protection by the new state's legal system. Meanwhile, California state legislators legalized Indian slavery, thus facilitating lethal slave raids as well as disposable labor regimes. In 1850, state legislators endorsed unfree Indian labor by legalizing white custody of Indian minors as well as Indian prisoner leasing. In 1860, they then acted to expand that original 1850 act to legalize the indenture of any Indians. These laws triggered a boom in violent slave raiding operations while separating women and men during peak reproductive years all of which work to facilitate population decline. Here in Los Angeles, one lawyer recalled, and I quote, Los Angeles had its weekly slave mart and thousands of honest, useful people were absolutely destroyed. Indeed, between 1850 and 1870, census takers tell us that LA's indigenous population plummeted from 3,693 to just 219. The United States Senate also made California Indian people particularly vulnerable. In 1851 and 1852, federal treaty commissioners negotiated 18 treaties with 119 California Indian tribes, setting aside some 7.488 million acres of land, or approximately 7% of the total land area of the state for reservations. However, Back in Washington, D.C., U.S. Senators repudiated each and every one of those treaties. Instead, in 1853, Congress approved the creation of five temporary military reservations not to exceed 25,000 acres each. The consequences were fourfold. First of all, these temporary reservations were not patented, and so jurisdiction over them remained uncertain. Second, California Indian people did not become the explicit legal wards of the federal government. Third, jurisdiction being uncertain led to confusion and conflict between and among state and federal authorities. Finally, the temporary reservation's legal status led to massive land loss while making California Indian people particularly vulnerable to kidnapping, slavery, assault, rape, and mass murder. The establishment of California's state militia system now marked the rise of a killing machine. California governors called out or authorized 24 state militia expeditions between 1850 and 1861, which killed an absolute minimum of 1,340 California Indian people. To support these campaigns, state legislators passed three bills that raised up to 1.51 million to fund them. By demonstrating that the state would not punish killers, but rather reward them, 
militias helped to inspire vigilantes to kill a further 6,400 people. Genocidal intent was only thinly veiled. In 1851, Peter Burnett, California's first elected state governor, publicly proclaimed that, and I quote, a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct. The following year, U.S. Senator John Weller, who would become governor of California in 1858, told the United States Senate that California Indians will be exterminated before the onward white march of the white man. The Sinkyon woman, Sally Bell, provided a rare California Indian eyewitness account of one massacre. She remembered, about 10 o'clock in the morning, some white men came. They killed my grandfather and my mother and my father. I saw them do it. Then they killed my baby sister and cut her heart out and threw it into the brush where I ran and hid. My little sister was just a baby, just crawling around. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared that I guess I just hid there for a long time with my little sister's heart in my hands. It was a terrifying time to be a California Indian. The United States government endorsed the killing. Congress passed two separate bills in 1854 and in 1860, allocating more than $1.3 million to reimburse the state of California for these militia expeditions. Some state, federal, and vigilante removal operations aimed at incarcerating surviving California Indian people on reservations led to further deaths. The Lake Yakuts woman Yoi Mut recollected that during the forced removal of her people to the Fresno reservation, my mother saw a dozen Indians killed and then 10 more on the way. Likewise, the Nome Lackey man, Andrew Freeman, recollected, when they took the Indians to the Round Valley Reservation, they drove them like stock and shot the old people who couldn't make the trip. They would shoot children who were getting tired. Once at federal Indian reservations, California Indian people often encountered institutionalized malnutrition, starvation, and forced labor. The Comcow leader, Tomayanem, recollected that after volunteers had forcibly moved his people to the Mendocino reservation, often we were very hungry and the Comcows began to die very fast. Other reservations were little better. In 1859, an army officer filed a report reading, some eight or 10 Indians dying daily at Round Valley due to syphilis and inadequate rations. Making reservations conditions worse, that year congressmen cut funding for California Indians by almost 70%. Thus, in 1860, officials typically provided 480 to 910 calories per day to working Round Valley inmates. By 1862, daily rations there fell to just 160 to 390 calories per person per day. The federal government also killed California Indian people more directly. The United States Army and their auxiliaries killed an absolute minimum of 1,680 California Indians between 1846 and 1873. In some sources indicate that US Army soldiers state militiamen and vigilantes killed at least 9,492 to 16,094 California Indian people between 1846 and 1873, and probably many, many more. Meanwhile, California Indians killed not more than 1,500 non-Indians during this entire period. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that California Indian people survived and their histories continue. As of 2018, more than 66,600 people are the enrolled citizens of California's 109 federally recognized California Indian tribes. Many others are members of non-federally recognized California Indian tribes. Whether or not state or federal authorities recognize them, California Indian people and California Indian nations endure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ben, for that brief but in exceptionally powerful and painful 
glimpse into understanding how uh, how violent, how systemic, how codified the treatment of Native Californians became under American rule, and we'll we'll weave we'll weave it, that into especially the Spanish and Mexican uh, eras as we get into our conversations uh, after um, after welcoming uh, two very special uh, family members uh, uh, to the panel. And uh, it's a true honor to have both Helen Louise Salazar and Christina Salazar join us. Uh, Helen is a Gabrielino Trangva elder. She has devoted her life uh, not only to raising uh, and sustaining her family and, and so many of her kin, uh, but to being a San Gabriel mission docent, a San Gabriel Historical Association trustee, She's deeply involved with the Gabrielino San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians. And of course, her family has lived in the San Gabriel, San Marino, kind of the greater Pasadena area, for those of you who are not as familiar with Southern California, uh, since the ancient times. Uh, she's a four, her fourth generation grandmother was Ilaria Perez uh, de, uh, de Guillen. Uh, who was the keeper of the keys, which I hope they'll share a bit more with us uh, at the San Gabriel mission. And as well, um, her great-grandmother on her other side was Estefano Duarte, and her understanding and depth um, of the Southern California landscape of the mission San Gabriel um, of uh, the Tongva Gabrielinos um, is unparalleled, and we're so grateful uh, that you are here. We're also grateful uh, to welcome Christina Salazar, um, with whom, of course, you both shared work and passed down uh, a deep love of understanding family, family history, and the ways in which that weaves into the broader fabric of both California uh, and the history of the Americas. Uh, Christina, too, uh, has been a docent at the, camp at the San Gabriel Mission, um, served in various capacities in the leadership there, as well as also having served on the San Gabriel Historical Association. Uh, she too is a Gabrielino Tongva elder and is deeply involved, uh, as is her mother and so many of her family, in sustaining and keeping alive and weaving in contemporary um, experience uh, with uh, the complicated and often painful uh, contours of the past. So. Um, uh, Helen, if I may, and Christina, uh, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. and we welcome you here to our Gabrielino territory, which we are at right now. Um, so I want to let you know a little bit about our family. We have a couple of pictures up here. Uh, the one family with the mother and the father, that is Evan Callahan and Estefana Duarte and their children. And that's where um, my mother's side of the family. And um, Evan, uh, Edward's father, Evan, came into um, California in the 1840s with the uh, Thomas Workman um, um, expedition. So they came into California with B.D. Wilson, that whole tom uh, temple, that whole party. Uh, so that's where that family came. And of course, Estefana Duarte is, uh, you know, one of the um, members of the Duarte, California, uh, that family. So we have that Spanish and um, Irish background there on the, my, my mother's side. On the other picture, uh, this is from my father's side. This is a picture of my uh, great, great grandmother and um, her husband on her wedding day and um, her mother behind her, who was half Gabrielino, uh, her mother, of course, full Gabrielino, Aurora. Um, so just a couple of pictures that we have in the family that we treasure. Um, I know that the one with Evan and um, Edward and uh, Estefana is actually in the uh, Los Angeles Public Library. I know somebody in the family member must have put it in there as they were gathering photos for of uh, Mexican Spanish families or uh, of California. So that was really interesting to find that over there when I was looking up stuff. 
Uh, I've always had a very great uh, um, uh, enthusiasm, uh, uh, you know, for the history and always wanted to find out more and more. And I think that was one of the things because it's not. One of the sad things is that it's not talked about, you know, they did not talk about it. They did not. Um, they did not want to teach their children Spanish. You know, they wanted to um, hide that they were Indian, hide that, you know, from other people because of this being enslaved. There's even some laws on the books in uh, Los Angeles where if any Indian came into the city, they were hung on site. So it was, it was a great, you know, deterrent for any Native American to to acknowledge that. Many of their items uh, we know were burned, buried, buried with them, you know, so that they didn't have any um, Indian artifacts with them, you know. So we, we, they kind of left those there, you know, discarded. Right. Anything else you want to say about the family? Uh, on my side, uh, they worked uh, caretakers, the Callahans, uh, for uh, General Patton and B.D. Wilson's properties. Uh, we were five generations there in San Marino. Living on that property. Living on that property, yes. And uh, my family did not want to teach me Spanish because I was going to San Marino schools. There was no... Spanish people there were Indian, so they didn't want, want to acknowledge that to separate us. So it was, was very sad. Right. They wanted to, to give their children a, a good education, a better education that they thought that would be a better education. You know, but it for us, it you, you lose so much. I think that's the sad thing about it. You lose it. You know, and so we start trying to gather whatever we can and information from the family and, and um, stories from the family. My the, the church would have the fiestas on the left is the picture of my daughter and my son, Christina and Eddie. Uh, I, my father, father in law brought back uh, when he went to Mexico, a little outfit for Eddie to wear and a beautiful outfit for Christina to wear. The next picture over was uh, my daughter, Christina Small, and uh, Steph uh, Stephanie. Uh, she was my, um, my uh, cousin's daughter. Cousins, yeah. And the lady in the middle, oh, she's so beautiful. That was Gabriela Kuros Temple. Her husband, and her would be uh, honoring people that would come into the mission. And uh, they would have parties during Fiesta time. And uh, it'd be a big, huge party for the for the birthday of the San Gabriel mission, Fiesta time. And they would have parades. And that's that bottom picture. These are me and my brother and my all my cousins. And uh, we would have a, a float, uh, my Aunt B, Alva, and... Um, uh, Fred Morales, Sparky Morales, and they would uh, um, get us all dressed up and and uh, you know show our Indian heritage, you know, in the in the fiest- fiestas. And so, you know, that's the thing with um, with the families. You know, they were always trying to um, and acknowledge. acknowledge it. You know, in 1928, we have it on the list where they were trying to you know let the government know. You know that they are Native Americans here. But we are not acknowledged in the federal government, which is very sad. We are in all the books, all the maps, and they do not recognize us. California does uh, because they went up and and got us recognized there. Through the state. Through the state, yeah. But not, not in the federal government, which is very, very sad. So this is a picture of the San Gabriel Mission um, and a picture of my mom talking about uh, with her docent work there. 
And these little motifs are actually what was on the original roof of the mission. Sadly, last year, July 11th, uh, 2020, there was a, a fire that was um, arson and the whole roof was destroyed on the church. Um, the um, statues there in the altar uh, were all smoke damaged. There was extensive damage throughout the mission. Uh, right now it's being um uh, refurbished and uh, the new roof is going up actually putting a lot of the the tiles on uh, the what do you call it? the uh, the roof. shingles you yeah. know shingles on the roof now yeah. you know so it's coming along but um we because of our family history we love going and doing the docent work with the children um i am pointing to also <laughs> so she's just there with the with the um the it's the old Spanish trail, you know. We so, belong to that too. So it's, it's just acknowledging, you know, the family um, heritage there. And one of the things with um, being the mission docent is that we can share our personal history with Eulalia being the keeper of the keys. Uh, we um, talk about her there at the mission talk about the Indians that built the mission, acknowledge that they were there. We know that they were there. There's a um, cross that's in the uh, Campo Santo that's acknowledging um, 6,000 Indians that died of cholera and disease. Small so and it's, it's a, for some people, you know, the mission has been, you know, with Father Never Sarah, it's been some, you know, very you know, bad feelings, uh, but, you know, for us, we acknowledge the mission. We live here in this area. We, our whole family is buried there since the 1700s. So we come to honor them. And um, we, you know, we, that's what our personal history, our living history, you know, to acknowledge that. And uh, we love telling little stories about Eulalia. She lived to be 110. She was with other women. She had come up with her husband. And uh, he was in the uh, military. Military, And he, she would, they had these women's cooking. They wanted a cook. So these women uh, were doing different dishes. And she got picked to be the, the cook. And she taught the Indian women how to cook, how to clean, how to sew. And it's very sad. They lock them in a room at night. That's as far as they would call her the keeper of the keys. Although she was, it was, she it, wasn't. Uh, she wasn't in charge, charge of them. Of yeah. But she just had keys to all the different storage areas in the area. So that's why, you know, she was in charge of different things. But she wasn't in charge of you know, their care, other people were in charge of, of the care of the Indians there, you know, so she makes that very, uh, that point in her oral history, um, you know, that she's very sad about that, about the treatment of the Indians there. Okay. And um, she's, you know, so we want to acknowledge that too, that she's not happy with, with the treatment of the Indians there. Um so, and then, you know, with the kids, we always, we always try to make little, little stories, you know, talk about, um, that's relating to, um, that they would, would understand, you know, so we always ask them, you know, are you, you know, where were you born? And, and, and we tell them, if you were born right here on this church, on this grounds of this church, you could be Native American, you could be Spanish, you could be Mexican. You could be American because all these countries were here, right here on this church, on these grounds. And um, so it's very interesting. We always have fun with the kids uh, wandering around and doing the tours. So we were we are hopeful with all the restoration and very sad that, you know, that the fire happened last year. But uh, hopeful for a new year. Wow. <laughs> this is. We, our friend Mike Gonzalez is a, was a full-blooded Navajo. Uh, this is us, and some people are missing. And every Saturday, we'd go over to his house, 
and he'd teach us how to do the peyote stitch, how to make a feather fan, how to, oh, he was wonderful. And that's the one thing with Native American history and culture. He wanted his knowledge passed down. He wanted it to be, to go on. He didn't want this knowledge to be lost anywhere. And so, you know, we recognize that and say, yes, we will help you, you know, continue your knowledge. And so that's a great tribute to, to Mike. And and we are forever grateful for him, for his, his knowledge. In the background, I don't know if you can see it good. This is a picture of the code talkers. And, uh, they all signed it for him. Yeah. And he so, was always in the powwows. He would put his regalia. Just in full regalia. Yeah. yeah. Really great man. We yeah. were sad sad to lose him a few years ago. We would go to all the different uh, powwows. So this, this is uh, us uh, making our clappers. Uh, my, my mother and my godmother. And uh, um, so on the other side is Julia Vagne, and who we also lost this year, a great, great loss of our cultural leader. So sad. And um, just, just continuing on this legacy, continuing on, um, you know, our knowledge. And uh, we just have to com- keep doing that. And we want to acknowledge these, these elders that are, are had worked so hard and, uh, to do it and to, to get us recognized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, cultural wise, we have the acorn festival up in Claremont that we go to. Uh-huh. And uh, we have uh, various little powwows around town, Santa Fe Springs, Citrus College. Um, and then we even go as far down with relatives that at San Luis Rey to their powwows. And then uh, um, all around. So we just want to, you know, keep continuing on with our legacy. So this is what we're talking about as we say that things were tossed out. Um, These baskets were just in the yard. And they were weather beaten and they were just tossed aside. And um, my uh, aunt... um, uh, Bialva, she uh, and this is a picture of her on the back down here by the back right underneath, yeah. And she was uh, also a top elder for the tribe, and she would uh, uh, go to different things also. And uh, but see, what we wanted to acknowledge that you know we they they brought these things back inside and and are now you know, in a place of honor. And, um, but it's, it's just that whole thing of, of acknowledging, yes, we are still here. Yes. You know, there, you know, a lot of people say, oh, there are no Indians. There are no Indians. It's like, oh my God, there's so many. We're all over. We're all over. But that's that we hid really good. We hid really good. We even, uh, two islands, uh, we, uh, have all the over in Santa Monica. There is a park de- dedicated to the Gabolino Talanga Indians. Uh, so, right so I think that's away from uh, the Santa Monica Pier. That's what's been really nice these last few years. Few years is, is finally these acknowledgments and these, um, you know, letting people know that yes, we're still here. Yes, we know you were here, and um, but they destroyed so many things. Yeah that uh, would have been beautiful to have now. And I think that's one of the things we just, we as elders now are just continuing on to let let our family know, you know. That we have meetings once a month. Cultural, yeah. Uh, cultural meetings. And uh, right now, naturally with the COVID going on and it's coming back, uh, it's, it's bad. We can't get together. But we want to, um, well, you know, I I think this is the hardest thing, you know, is just uh, we are still here. Uh And when they tried to do away with us, uh, they would say they were something else, like they were Spanish or they were 
they didn't want yeah, to. Yeah, they didn't acknowledge they were Indian. They would say they were they were white because they were married to a white man, or they were Spanish because they were married to a Spanish man. But they didn't want to be taken away. Mm -hmm. But they still were here. And I think that's the other thing too here in 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 San Gabriel is we help each other. We help each other through hard times, and uh, and we're still we're still here. I want to thank you so much uh, for letting us be a part of this talk. Oh, and we were amazed. <laughs> I'm very happy to, to share our knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen and Christina. Uh, I'm, a, I'm kind of awash with so many different emotions and and thoughts as you've shared with us so poignantly the ways in which you and your family are kind of living examples of both how to continue to try and create and sustain kinship and uh, in, especially in uh, your um, your homelands in Southern California and just how challenging that is when so much has been lost when so much has been disrupted and which with so much uh, uh, violence uh, perpetrated as well as um, I think you beautifully explained to the the erasure we you, your family kind of erased parts of its own history and in order to survive in order to assimilate um, but then how of course what we call sometimes the silencing of the past right a wonderful Haitian historian talked so poignantly about that Michelle Roth Trulio about how the past is silenced in the archives as Erica said the past is silenced um, sometimes before it even has a chance to uh, to begin, um, uh, Benjamin, as your work shows us so well. And then sometimes how we silence our own past, um, but how in community with historians, with family members, with activists, with storytellers, that we can try and reconstitute the past and its complexity. So we have about a half an hour together and I first want to express my deep gratitude to all four of you for sharing your, um, your scholarship, sharing your wisdom, um, and really sharing all of your work. And it's, it's wonderful for me to be uh, in this space, as surreal as it is in our complicated time of COVID and the cascading crises around that that we're all still working through and recovering from. And as you know, many communities of color, many Native communities uh, were particularly impacted and are still particularly impacted by all of these crises, especially the pandemic. So I want to engage us in conversations that, um, in a way, there's no good place to start, right? Because we're talking about um, ages of, of, of life and, and um, community creation and kinship creation across the place that we call California, which was a place, of course, long before it was imagined by a Spanish novelist in 1510. Um, it's a place much, much older than that, but of course, a place that changed dramatically uh, once the arrival of the Spanish uh, into the American Southwest started making and remaking Native ways. Slavery, as we know, of course, existed before the arrival of the Spanish and in intertribal slavery. Um, but the Spanish, Mexican, and then American occupation of the Southwest and especially California would change that forever. Um, so Erica, I would appreciate your um, starting to answer uh, a question, which is really just maybe sharing some of your reflections, especially when you listen uh, to both Ben's work that came after you and then uh, the intimate histories, if you will, of, um, of Helen and Christina, what kind of reverberated for you? What echoed for you in your work um, throughout time and up until today? Uh, thank you uh, for asking the question. I, I think for me, what has reverberated is how important it is for us to introduce the American West into this conversation about systems of bondage, about enslavement, about genocide. Uh, for those of us who have grown up in the West, we know that um, racial relations is not black-white solely, uh, that the black-white paradigm of discussions of race in this country really neglects a lot of community dynamics, 
and experiences. And certainly if we factor in indigenous peoples into that conversation and center them, uh, I think that gives us a, a different lens in which we can start, start to talk about reconciliation, about remembrance, um, about uh, systems of, of enslavement and, and darker elements of our history. We are undergoing a period right now of efforts to erase, once again, histories of indigenous peoples Mexican American peoples, other communities in this country by um, elected officials, by school book, textbook standards. And I think it's really important that we have symposiums like this uh, sponsored by the Smithsonian so that we can recenter these histories and remind people that the living descendants uh, continue to exist today uh, of those early peoples um, who you know, bore witness to genocide, who bore witness to their homelands being taken over. So for me, that's really what has reverberated is the importance of remembering uh, the continued survival of communities, despite efforts to erase their histories. Um, that history has still continued to be transmitted through various means, whether through rituals, whether through um, ceremony, whether through song, whether through text, um, and so I, I do think it's important for us to have these kinds of conversations so that we can look at race relations in this country more complexly. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm always reminded too that the ways in which history can be our guide in that if we actually even pause to look at the official records of the, of the Spanish um, incursions and, and conquest into especially Southern California, as well as to all of Alta California, we would realize that from the start, just like your families, Christina and Helen, they were of course Mestizo, Mestizo. They were blended from the beginning due to that kind of the Northern edge of Spain's colonial frontier. Many were Afro Mestizo, remember many were of already very mixed indigenous European and African ancestry. And what's astounding is that in, that is that was suppressed as you have shared with us internally and that was enforced then very firmly externally um, as as kind of as whiteness was was privileged and, and created and it was um, it was not a cause for kind of any kind of synthetic understanding of um, of what those times must have been like especially the 19th century um, that remains I think so much kind of in the fog of um, of the past. Um, Benjamin, when you started your work, I just kind of shift over a little bit to understanding institutionalized genocide. How did like Erica's work, Al Hurtado's work, others um, help you understand the, um, the long history? Uh, we were talking before Erica, um, you said too that um, we think often that um, that the American period was better or that we compare colonial periods really. Um, but that of course, that um, whether it be indentured, indentured servitude or slavery, that this is really kind of a continuum of, um, of, of sadly compatible, tragically compatible systems of slavery. Um, ben, maybe kind of contextualize that a bit more for us. Well, Eric, I really like what you said about trying to move away from a simple binary of free and slave, black and white, to look at a variety of systems of servitude that ensnared various different communities, whether they were African American, Native American, Asian American, uh, Pacific Islanders or others, because in the West, we see a very complex overlapping of many different systems. And then the ways in which people are bound are really multifarious. I, I think of uh, California Indians being bound in what I call a system of servitude. Uh, there was under the rule of the United States, wardship, there was indenture, there was custodianship, there was legalized prisoner leasing, and then there were illegal forms of outright chattel slavery, people being bought and sold. And we could also think of a form of disposable labor 
particularly on the reservation where people were, I think, pretty intentionally worked to death. And when we look at the calculus of rations that are absolutely starvation rations, as I mentioned in my talk, for example, at Round Valley, there is a period when people are definitely receiving fewer than 200 calories per day, and then only if they worked. There was, I think, probably a very clear expectation that would people would be worked until dead. Uh, now, what about the connection between Russo-Hispanic California and U.S. California in terms of those particular indigenous systems of servitude? Um, since I wrote that book, I've actually published an article called California's First Mass Incarceration System, in which I describe the missions as a form of penal servitude, in which the crime, quote unquote, of California Indian people is simply being Indian. And the project of the missions is to transform indigenous people into Catholic workers in indigenous bodies who serve, uh, as, as you said, Erica, the Spanish and then the Mexican colonial project in California. And when we think about that system at the missions, it's also quite complex and really calls out to scholars to investigate what the systems of servitude are, because uh, one of the things you had asked, how did Erica's work inspire me? And one of the things that I thought about was the way in which God parentage, which seems on its surface entirely benign, becomes a way of ensnaring people in this complex system of obligations that can be excused simply as, oh, what a nice, what a nice thing to have God parent. Uh, but in fact, that becomes part of holding people possibly against their will uh, to do the will of other people. So, you know, we can think about the mission project in the way that we teach it today as sweetening something really nasty. Um, my own kids had to build those sugar cube mission models in the fourth grade. And fortunately, we've, we've moved forward. The California State Legislature, just a few years ago, passed a non-binding joint resolution suggesting to teachers that they no longer focus so obsessively on the missions. Uh, but we don't have funding for an alternative curriculum. So one of the things that I've been involved with, uh, other UC and Cal State professors and people from California Indian communities is working on a proposal for a full intervention in our K through 12 teaching standards to bring California's original people in, not just in the fourth grade, but at all 13 grades from kindergarten through the senior year in high school. And uh, you know, that's an, that's an uphill battle. We're definitely not the first group of people to try to make that happen. That's been happening at least since the mid 1960s. But I think there is some momentum and there is some interest among Californians in really talking about this history uh, rather than just burying it or silencing it. Uh, thank you for that. And, and I think that project in particular of which you were speaking, which I uh, know a little bit about, um, because of that blending of, of native knowledge, scholarly knowledge, um, will go, I think, a long way. Um, but you're right, we all have to continue to support it. Um, I'm struck too, though, Benjamin, by kind of then the, the lived experience, of course, of, of Helen and Christina and their great, 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 and great, 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 great uh, grandmother, Eulalia Perez. And I want to get to that in a minute, because I do think that the Ways in which, especially the women I've studied from that time period, uh, Juana and Guadalupe Briones, who were both curanderas and midwives and um, who were afro mestiza and who adopted and became the godmother, the madrinas of many, many um, uh, mixed race, uh, many, many indigenous California Indians. And it's, it's so, the silences in that archive are so vast because we don't really know their relationships. We don't know how they cared for one another. We don't know how those um, incredible women embrace Catholicism, to your point, uh, Erika. We don't really know the ways in which um, their, uh, their daily lives occurred. We don't know what it felt like for Eulalia to lock the door. 
We do know that she was widowed. She was trying to care for her family when she became the keeper of the keys. And we do know too that her lineage, her powerful lineage, especially of daughters and granddaughters and great, great, great granddaughters was incredibly strong. Um, from the very famous photograph that was taken of her in 1876, um, boosters of California, white boosters of California uh, claimed she was 140 and they wanted to take her to the Philadelphia Centennial Fair celebrating uh, the United States uh, first 100 years. Um, but it was her daughters, your ancestors, um, Helen and Christina, who blocked that, successfully blocked that from having taken their basically their beloved matriarch um, as kind of part of a freak show to show how sunny and wonderful California was because you could live to 140. Um, that next year is when she gave her testimonial, when she gave her oral history. And um, as you as you know, because you've read it, I think I'll probably read it, but of course, Christine and Helen, you've lived it. Um, she had an incredibly complicated relationship to the mission. Um, and, um, and even then when she remarried and kind of came away from the mission, um, her, their large rancho, your family rancho, San Pascual was again, of course, um, but threatened and then taken, uh, away after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, and, um, uh, even though that she had of course, full claim to, she and her husband had full claim to the land. Um, so Helen and, um, and Christina, either one of you, as you understand and live the, the, um, the ex your lived experience and then hearing um, um, both Erica and, and Benjamin, um, when you're at the mission, um, it seems to me you shared with us too, kind of the, like the weight of all that history, right? that you feel that, but yet you've also been brave enough to help children Across, I'm guessing generations now try and understand a different perspective. So if you would um, be so kind, kind of share with us kind of how that, how that feels, how you incorporate different ongoing, your own, you know, kind of journey as, as, um, as learners and, and simultaneously as educators, how do you kind of weave that all together? I think of belonging to the, Historical Association. I'm able to uh, look at documents. Yeah, look at documents. Look at. Uh, I even had a whole thing that they, like you said, wrote up about Eladia, and uh, we have a picture of her. And it's just uh, amazing. She lived so long to 110, not 140. <laughs> so she had eleven kids. Yeah. <laughs> she. And when she passed away, she just passed away down the street, right next on the mission property. She went, uh, La Vieja, uh huh. It's a little house down the way, beautiful little house, uh, Adobe house. But I think that's the thing too. It's like when you when you find out this information, and then you say, "Well, that is my history," mm -hmm. and you start looking back and further and further, and start finding more pieces of the history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that was the interesting thing too, because we knew we were related to her, but we didn't know her actual or oral history. So that when we actually got that knowledge and got that her 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 paperwork and read mm -hmm. that. You know, so it just adds more to our story to tell the, the next generations of children, you know, and family members. And I, I, that's one thing for us, too, because most of the descendants of Eulalia um, do not live in this area anymore. They're all over mm -hmm. across the United States. Um, I think we're the one, the only ones that live, you know, here in San Gabriel. Um so it just adds to this, you know, when we start looking, um, I always have to laugh because my, my niece, we, we were, um, she came over one time and I had a, like a genealogy. So I had, you know, mom and dad and their moms and dads and their moms and dads. And um, I was clipping all these little uh, <clears throat> three by five note, notepads on the wall. Well, it got to be too much. So I actually draped a sheet and then put those, clip those note three by fives on top of it. I had the whole wall covered. 
I looked inside a room. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, this is our family history. You know, these are our generations. These are our family. I think that, that that's the thing. It's just learning more and finding out more about the family and then spreading that knowledge. We've lived yeah, here over now, I think, 60 years. Uh-huh. And then, uh, other, I lived in San Marino. And then, like uh, I was saying earlier, it it was San Gabriel. So my mother, instead of being born in San Marino, she was born in San Gabriel because of uh, on Man- Monterey Road right next to Lacey Park, uh, which it is called now. And... Uh, it's amazing, all the generations. We've looked up so much. Tina's looked up so much. We go to different uh, um, historical... The genealogy, genealogy. Um, Southern California Genealogy Society, where we meet other relatives, which yeah. is really interesting because they're like, funny. wait a minute, we're related. Yeah. I'm like, are we really related? He yeah. goes, yes, here's my genealogy. And then and we- I was like, okay, cousin. <laughs> In. <laughs> so it's really nice, uh, you know, doing that too, because we get to go to different archives mm-hmm. and and find out more information, and just adds adds more to the story. And I think that's it. You want to keep adding to your story because the story was lost, mm-hmm. and you're regaining it again and adding to it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're you're already uh, you're proving, I think, so many points about why, especially community history. While all all of us as public historians, as scholars, as educators, why it it we the, the need for us to come into community, make sure those archives are available, accessible, make sure that they're they're shared and they're understood, and and that they then can help you create those walls with sheets on them. Um, because I think as both Ben and Erica know, the the level of disruption the, that all of these intertwining systems caused is something almost unfathomable. And, um, and it, you can get, you can kind of fall into despair or you can rise up to try and, and reconstitute, right? Reconstitute the world, right. reconstitute your family. Um, Helen, you said that they destroyed so many things that would have been beautiful now. And I think that that could maybe be, um, the uh, one of the titles for uh, for actually for this whole symposia, um, and I want to turn back um, uh, to Erica um, as you think about the the making the remaking, especially along the lines of um, of women's relationships um, along the lines of Compradasco. Um, share with us some of the thoughts. Um, as you kind of have, are listening just now on, uh, and then also with your, your great work on how this kind of this weave of, of relationships um, has, has changed over time or kind of as you're seeing it now, even just with Helen and Christina. Well, one thing that I think needs to be addressed is the ways in which people come to learn about indigenous history in California, about mission history. Uh, There is very scarce attention paid to women's labors, women's work in those missions, in those presentations of the physical spaces. So we need docents like uh, Christina and, and Helen to do some of that heavy lifting of explaining and filling in the gaps. Because if you go to various missions and you visit missions in Southern California, for example, you see such a disparity in the presentation of information. So for example, the public run La Purisima Concepcion actually shows the physical space where women were kept prisoner and were locked in at night. You see that physical space, which I think is very important to to show to people, to tourists who are coming into California or even Californians themselves who are looking at these spaces and trying to learn something about the history. But when you go to other mission spaces, a lot of that is erased. They may appear, it may appear on a map that this was the nunnery where the women were were held, but there's relatively little context or explanation given. And in some spaces, it's completely erased. There's not even a mention uh, on the map that this took place. Um, If you look at some of the plaques and statues that exist on mission spaces, they tend to privilege a lot of the male 
elements of history and, and women are not really captured in some of those presentations in terms of what they did or, you know, what families or what matriarchs existed or, you know, the, the kinds of works of curanderas, of, of healers, of parteras, the midwives, you don't get that part of the history. Um, and so I think one of the things that is the benefit of this panel is we are talking about ways in which certain histories have been erased um, including uncomfortable histories, histories that make people uncomfortable, which, you know, that is the role of history. It's not to make everyone feel good all the time. It is to provoke, to get us challenged in thinking in critical ways. And I think that for those viewers who have toured missions, I would really urge them to think about what isn't being shown to them, uh, what isn't being uh, presented to them, uh, certainly along gender lines, but also just in terms of the, the kind of quality of, of um, artifacts. So if you go to San Fernando Rey, for example, it, in many respects, it resembles a tchotchke shop. There are artifacts in there that are basically tchotchkes about showing people from the Plains region and not really from California. But if you were to contrast that, let's say with Mission Santa Barbara, you have a wonderful display there of living descendants today, their pictures, their photographs, along with their ancestors in the display. And I think that is the way to go because you show the continuity and the survival of peoples that who are still living and thriving today, not this kind of old trope about this quote unquote vanishing Indian, right? And so there are different ways in which this history needs to be presented um, in an ethical way, in a way that is um, much more substantive, has more depth, uh, than the kind of gloss that we sometimes get at some of these mission spaces. So the work of Christina and Helen as docents and the work of other community members from the local tribes and indigenous um, nations is really instrumental in that. Thank you so much for that um, incredibly kind of thoughtful and intersectional uh, assessment. Um, and you're right, the gloss of the California dream of California exceptionalism within Ameri you know, United States exceptionalism, the notion of California as the golden state of a free state. Um, of course, under you know, the, the horror of, of officially sanctioned slavery and genocide, Benjamin, as, as, uh, as we all know, and Benjamin, as your work is so um, illuminated, um, those things need to be reconciled in our, in our work, in our hearts, in our scholarship, in our curricula, um, and then, as, as we know, on the ground where people learn, whether it be in a museum setting uh, or in a historic site, um, like many of the California missions. Um, ben, speaking about your work, you ended um, with the, uh, the growing number of official and unofficial um, tribal, uh, officially recognized and, unof and unofficially recognized, although you're right, the power of states like California to recognize tribes, I think, is an essential part of the remediation and the, re uh, the reclaiming work that needs to be done. Um, talk to us a bit about how you've seen um, uh, that resilience, how you've seen that um, kind of that making where such unmaking reigns, as the poet Adrian Rich has written. Um, and, and kind of what you see for the future of this kind of weaving in the scholarship with the activism, with the families um, um, and all of us who care so deeply about California's future. Well, if we think about what it means to do ethical Native American studies or ethical Native American history, uh, one of the ideas that Phil Deloria at Harvard has pointed out is that that work ought to in some way serve not only to reshape uh, how we see the past, you know, as Christina said, I, I'm sorry, as Erica said, to, to provoke, um, but it also ought to serve, if it can, the direct and immediate interests of indigenous communities today. So some of the work that historians have done in the past uh, has been very important to that. So uh, if we think about the major struggle for terminated California tribes, to be reinstated, much of the work has been possible 
because historians, anthropologists, and others have done that deep, deep digging to create the files brought before judges and juries or brought to the Bureau of Indian Affairs or brought to Congress so that Congress can uh, pass an act that recognizes or re-recognizes the tribe uh, or so that it can be brought actually to the White House uh, to help facilitate an executive order that can restore a tribe. All of that work's very important. And that's also been important in terms of the state's recognition process of <laughs> California Indian people. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I think is, is helpful is for us as educators at the university level to be working with educators at the K through 12 level, because we can never really get that far in the college or university system when none of our students, unless they're indigenous, really know about California Indian history. So that's why I think, you know, we keep coming back to that, whether it's the crucial work of docents uh, operating in those mission spaces where really, you know, tens of thousands of students pass through each of those places every year. I mean, this is a major, a major line item that California has budgeted for, for fourth graders to go to museums and to go to missions. So at the Autry Center here in Los Angeles, you know, that's the, the bulk of the visitors at that museum are fourth graders coming on their mandated fourth grade mission field trip. So that's a, a really important place to, to intercede and to change the way people understand the history. But it's also happening that scholars are increasingly engaging directly with indigenous communities. A uh, project that I've been working on for a couple of years is the uh, Digital Atlas of California Native Americans, uh, in which not only do we present all of the information about the genocide, uh, but a lot of information about trade routes, about culture. Right. And every single one of California's tribes, whether or not they're federal or state recognized, has the opportunity to upload materials, videos, music, photographs, the tribal constitution, tribal bylaws. And uh, that kind of work, I think, is where Native American studies in California really needs to go. It's this cooperative dialogue between the scholar in their ivory tower setting with their graduate students and their undergraduates and the indigenous community on the other side saying, hey, here's what we would like you to investigate. This would be helpful for us for you to think about this and for us to work together uh, to try to create a more accurate picture of the past, but also to think about how to present and convey that more accurate picture of the past to the wider public in a way that Absolutely. is respectful of and helpful to California's first peoples. Thank you, Benjamin. And to take all that too, and then to communicate that through all of our public history sites, including up to the Smithsonian, so, or out to the Smithsonian. Um, uh, Tina, Christina, and, and Helen, as Benjamin and Erika and I have talked about kind of our roles as scholars and, and the projects that we've done together, what do, what do you need from us as in the scholarly community and the museum community to best help you, your families, as, as you kind of both live and learn and reconstitute um, and re-empower, really, um, the incredible stories of your families? Well, I think that's the one thing that that uh, over the last few years has been very interesting. I know with um, looking up with the church records with the early California mm -hmm. project that the um, Huntington and the, um, you know that you can go in and access that. I know it's it's a little it's been a little bit challenging trying to work through how to access that <laughs> since we're not scholars like you <laughs> or, or computer wizards, uh, it should, but it should we be have hard. Gotten hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, I, I love the fact that it's more accessible now mm -hmm. um, before where, you know, it's like, oh, well, you have to come into a place, you know, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of the internet and the beauty of more of these things being digitized and more. Uh, so, I mean, for us, that, that's been a really great help because we can actually learn more more of our our genealogy that way you know where and i think that's one of the things too with with the with the mission records because that there's some 
mission records way back that actually say what village they came from, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's been a really big help too. Um, And um, just, just like I said, the access has, has been uh, more available, you know, where before it's like, you couldn't, you couldn't really access it. So that's what I'd like more, you know, and, and I'm glad for having more access. Thank you, Tina. Helen, I'm going to give you the last word. I'm going to to give you the last word of the panel as we're wrapping up. Uh, You were talking about uh, the children. I, I thought that was wonderful to learn more about the tribes, to do this. And Chief Anthony Morales is doing that with the tribe. Uh, he uh, is teaching uh, the young kids how to dance. They dress up in their regalia. We've gone to the Santa Monica, I mean, uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific in October. They put on uh, for the whole weekend, the Chumash go, we go. They have dancing. It's beautiful. Little kids have their little outfits on and regalia. And they, uh, it, it's wonderful to have all the kids learning. They are. Right. And as you were saying, too, uh, this is what I last say. Uh, the, it was sad at the mission. Uh, there was a woman. Uh, her name was Tuparina. And she did a, she was fed up with everything. And she was uh, in an uprising there at the church. And it, and they even put a play on. We have a, I had a play at the Civic Auditorium here in St. Gabriel, beautiful auditorium. Uh, and uh, she was saying, they were saying that, you know, what she had done. Uh, and then, they forced her to marry somebody else and move up north. I mean, it's sad. Everything. Right. But she's an incredible <laughs> example, Toyparina, of that resistance uh, yeah. that is part of the through line uh, that remains today and, and that we honor um, as we do our work together. So, Arika, ben- Benjamin, uh, Helen, and Christina, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of all of us at the Smithsonian and all who are listening and all who will listen um, when, uh, when at their own leisure as this will live as a, a long, long time online as well. So thank you all. Take the best of care. Take the best of care of your families um, and know how much we appreciate all of you for the gift of time and for the gifts of all that you do. Thank you you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. You were wonderful too. (laughs)